love. <laughs> no, I, um, after doing my A-levels and matura in Austria, I went to London and uh, supposing they only do a proficiency course in English and then go back to university to Austria. But things changed and I got married instead <laughs> and uh, to a Chinese gentleman from Hong Kong and uh, had two children and lived 10, 12 years in London. So that what brought me to Hong Kong the first time. And um, I loved the place from the first minute I saw it. And uh, 30 years ago, I met my second husband, Ronnie, and moved here and lived here since 30 years permanently. I would say 44 years ago was the first time I arrived, 43 years ago, something like that. And uh, I really fell in love with it. It was the vibe, the smell, the looks, the, the difference which was very different, but still somehow familiar. And um, I must say, I had a, yeah, I, ju I just loved it, you know, and the people were all very friendly. And I always had family here, you know, because I came into a big family, learned a lot of Chinese traditions through them. So the very formal tradition was kneeling down to serve tea to the elderly. Every, yes, my children still have to do it, which going, mom. <laughs> and I go like, yep, Chinese New Year, you kneel down in front of, uh, your parents and served them tears respect. So to appreciate, so yes, I must say I learned and saw a lot straight when I was young. And I suppose when you're young, you find it exciting and you take it in and you love it. I accepted the culture and the food, which is very important. You never should go to a country and say, oh, I don't want to try it, no, I don't like this. And I think you, if you try to integrate yourself, you normally will be integrated. So I think it is very much an attitude. And you know, I, I thought it was all wonderful, and uh, no, I was accepted. And don't forget, it was a British colony at that time. So it wasn't, yes, it was very Chinese, but it wasn't that Chinese. You know, there was everything you could think about and how even now, you know, Hong Kong is so mul multinational. I mean, look at it, we have Christmas and we have Easter. We have uh, Buddha's birthday. We have the Moon Festival. We have Dragon Boat Festival. I mean, even our holidays show how different angles Hong Kong has, and um, it was good. I mean, yes, I can remember when I wanted cheese 40 years ago, you got Emmentaler and you got maybe the little laughing cow, and then the one in the red, that was it, you know. Bread was pretty much long-lived bread, but now everything you want we have. When you go to little side streets now, and even if you go in Central, you know, you go up Stanley Street, you go up... Uh, well, you know, Leather Street, you go, wherever you go, like, there is still those kind of pockets, which that's how it looked everywhere. You know, you have the markets, you had the fish seller, the vegetable sellers, it's always fresh. Nobody in Hong Kong ever eats a fish which lived for 48 hours. You would normally buy in the morning, kill it and eat it. Even if, if you can afford fish, you would go there and buy a part only, but it has to be fresh. The vegetable have to be, you know, it's, I think it's very much an emphasis on good quality Chinese food and everywhere markets. You know, it was like you walked through and you didn't ever wore very much your best shoes <laughs> because <laughs> it was a lot of splashing and a bit of wet. But um, no, it was uh, yeah, the community, I think, was much more, well, local orientated. And there was lots of the kind of what we call mama and papa shops, you know, the light, tiny little one shop which sold the rice and one sold this and now it's supermarkets. Now we are in waitress and welcomes and whatever like all over the world. So we have the same here, park and shop and it's not anymore the small little shops you went to, which is a little, it's sad because I think that was, I think that was a lot of character for a city. And if we went to Wan Chai, you know, you had Card Street where from the wedding card to the funeral cards, everything was printed there. 
and then it was all torn down. Something has been very newly built, which looks on the bottom similar. You know, they had to keep like the feeling of it, but it's modern shops, modern. But then again, when you look at it, the people lived up the houses above there. They had no running water. There was no really toilet. So for them, it was an improvement in life. For us, ah, oh, it was so cute. Oh, it was so nice. Why couldn't they keep it? Well, <laughs> you know. We liked it for the quaintness and they wanted a new life, you know, they wanted running water in their house and the toilet. So it's always give and take, you know. And I mean, this is lots of in Queen's Road East. There was, I mean, you know, you wanted an embroidered wedding jacket or you wanted the coffin for the funeral or you wanted, the, it didn't matter what part of life, you would find every shop or the repair shop when the then very rare air conditioned people had needed to be repaired or the fan. It was all just around the corner. Now it's uh, boutiques, boutiques, boutiques and expensive shops. You know, it's, it has changed, yes. My first mother-in-law did not speak any English. The family did. Um, yeah, well, first hand and feet. Uh, and then I learned a bit of Chinese, you know, so I could go by, how are you and what would you like? And are you well? And, you know, so, you know, like this kind of basic Chinese. Um, but, uh, you know, in Hong Kong, everybody kind of speaks pidgin English. And when I speak Chinese, they all start laughing. So I understand, but I don't speak it really. <laughs> it's very difficult, the pronunciation. I can't hear the many, many tones. That you ate the food, that was very important. I can I have a few friends, so I've known about people who don't touch it. And they're straight away not really welcomed, which is very funny because the Chinese culture, like, we always say love goes through the stomach, but the Chinese culture, I think, is very important that you appreciate their food. Wherever you go, they serve you and you eat it. You don't, you know, you can like it or not like it, but thank God I always liked most things. Even, yeah, I can see it now, 20 kilos more. But, you know, I just liked my food, you know, so and that was always a new drink. Also in Chinese culture, they, they like people who drink with them. It's a trust thing. They, they also have a saying, like, I think we have in European too, you know, you never sit with somebody sober on the table when you drink because they take advantage of you. So in Chinese, you know, when somebody say, Yam Sing or Yam Boy, you do the same. For two years, we walked around China and it was an interesting experience to set up a charity in China because it, the concept didn't exist. Even when, you, when we tried to sign our final contract, we had charity in there, but the word in Chinese characters doesn't exist. So we actually, they created a new um, documentation for us because, you know, it, everything had to be very legal, cor correct, and, and, and. So our memorandum of article, the whole thing, was, a new, was new lines in China. They didn't even, it didn't exist. And we took, I think, two years to find the land because, well, some of the places we went to show us mental hospitals and all that said so don't worry you can put the elderly there you know and we share the profit I go like no this is not our concept <laughs> our concept is quality of life you know and if they want to you know whatever dance and sing and when they want to learn how to write we like if possible provide that we try to give them the best in the end of their days so I think one of the stories which really I mean that brought tears to my eyes um, the first intake of Hong Kong elderly and we had an old man and he asked and we have quite a lot of land there and we have fish ponds and even farming organic vegetable now and all that for the elderly as exercise but also for supply for food for the home and uh, he asked us if anybody has a kite he wants to fly a kite we went like okay well kites were like I don't know one euro or something ten renminbi uh, so we bought him a kite and he actually, on a windy day, ran the kite and was the happiest person I've ever seen. And he said he once did a, was a kite when he was like 10 years old, when his family had enough money and they went for an outing and they all had food and he flew a kite. And his rest of his life, he never had a day off. He was just working, working. And this was, you know, and then you know, oh, that's a good stuff. You know? <laughs> Something is right. And I can remember the 30th of June at night time, sitting at Tamer when it was the... British um, handover ceremony with the three British band playing Prince Charles in front of us, the governor, Mr. Patton, Mrs. Patton, 
everybody very emotional because you know they just moved out of government house so you know and actually Mrs. Pat Nozer was once a patron of our charity and she was a very good patron. She was very hands-on and very visiting the elderly and inviting elderly teas to government house and all that which was very nice. So um, then we had the player here. So the whole crowd was sort of dignities were sitting in front row and we were a few rows behind. Everybody got so soaked. It was raining, you had umbrellas, but you literally could feel the water running in the back out there, in there. It was awful. It was bucketing down. So, and then from there, the flags came down and then we moved over to the convention center. And at midnight, um, again, very fortunately out of Ronnie, you know, really very front row, so very good seats, you could see a lot. The, the armies moved in. It was like from the right side, the British came with the flag. Uh, from the left side, you know, the Chinese, in goose step, the Chinese, by the way. Very interesting. <laughs> Military goose step for the Chinese. And all of them were very tall uh, soldiers. You know, where everybody was like, wow, they have such tall people in China. Because it was like, you never saw them, really. I mean, when did you see a Chinese soldier? And, um, and then it, it was very emotional. I can remember when the British flag came down to the anthem. And I think there were a few tears in the crowd, and it was a huge crowd. And then the Chinese flag came up, and you know, and a few speeches, and then swearing in straight away of um, the new Chinese government. I mean, the Hong Kong government, the Chinese government, the Hong Kong government. And then I can remember we all went. <clears throat> I mean, the then legislative council. I think those people went into a small little room to actually put through the first uh, law enforcement that Hong Kong being part of China and our constitutional rights and uh, the one system, one country, two system. And it was quite, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was quite big nights. Nobody quite knew what was coming. That was, I think, the, this all hype and the scariness and everybody, oh my God, what a poor Hong Kong. Because nobody knew what the Chinese really wanted, because they don't really talk about that much, you know, what they wanted to implicate here. But I can remember when it was midnight, when on, on the border, when the, the troops came in, and everybody was so afraid the troops might take over. And what they did, I mean, I've, I've been now 20 years later, I hardly see a Chinese soldier. I mean, I see them in vans being blocked up, going from one camp to the other, but you would never see them out. And they kept a very, very low profile. And also when they came in, I think, thank God, and we weren't so surprised, but I think the British were very surprised. People stood on the side with flags and welcomed. So that was quite a good move. They, did, they felt welcomed. They didn't feel like, you know, rejected straight away. And then they went into their camps and their houses and never were seen again, kind of. We are China, but we are very fortunate to have a different uh, constitution and we have different rights and we have the, law, um, the basic law. So I think to work with it, and let's say, yes, we want to get into a different election uh, system and all that, but uh, can't be achieved with sitting on the street and shouting and screaming. It's the wrong way, you know. Only dialogue will do it. You want something in Hong Kong to happen, it will happen. You want anything, really. I mean, you know, um, maybe that's like, too much, but if you want to buy an elephant, you can buy an elephant. You know, it is like, uh, it is, this whole city is still now, in a way, very, very um, entrepreneurial and very open and very, you know, can do kind of city, which is nice. I feel it's my home, but when I, I never want to give up Austria. Austria is always definitely my heart. So I think the split between, it's so easy now. Before, yes, it took an awful long time. It took like two to three stops to come to Hong Kong. Now, I mean, 12 hours in Vienna. I landed in Vienna two weeks ago. 12 hours later, I'm in the middle of it, you know. So, so it's not anymore, and I'm fortunate always, I never was homesick because I always had the chance to go back and I went back every year a few times. So no, it never, I always felt both, you know, I'm definitely at home in Hong Kong. It is my home, but when I go back to Austria, it's, I'm home there too and I'm fortunate that I have homes in Austria, so places I go back to. Well, I'm Austrian in my heart, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> And I always will be, and you know, I'm very proud to be Austrian. I would never change my passport. I would, uh, 
you know, I, I did for a few years the Vienna Opera Ball here because I think it was very important to bring all, I think our big forte in the world, everybody kind of loves us, not because we were so small, but because I think our culture and our somehow knowing to deal with people, you know, it's, there's a kind of, I think most Austrian have this kind of very openness and a bit friendliness and a bit of charm, you know, it's just like, so people feel welcome when they go there. And what they see about Austria, well, it's a very pretty country, it's beautiful, you know, when you see pictures, they all go like, oh my God, it's like in the movies. But I think it's the cultural exchange which we can do a lot. And, you know, we can, yeah, we're lucky. We are lucky we got amazing musicians. So everybody knows what a Vienna the Waltzer sounds and wherever you go in the world. And they said, ah, Australia. I'm like, no, kangaroos, da 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 da. Ah, Vienna. So, you know, people straight away, you know, know where you come from as soon as you start singing a waltz. So, which is, um, yeah, no, I'm proud to be Austrian. Mm -hmm.